Hey, good day to you. Welcome to RFD Illinois on a Monday, the 29th of April. I'm Rita Frazier here at the Illinois Farm Bureau in Bloomington. Well, lots of news to pass along. It's Monday, so we get to talk to the corner economist. That's Mike Doherty. He's our senior economist at the Illinois Farm Bureau. Mike talks uh, about uh, several issues, including the release last Friday from the University of Illinois College of Aces. They did an analysis of the impact the tariffs have had on Illinois agriculture. We've been waiting on these numbers, and they break them down uh, very clearly. Corn, soybeans, hogs, etc. Mike has the details, and he'll tell you how you can get a look at that report for yourself. Matt Kay is along. He files a report on the U.S.-Japan talks, and we'll dive into the U.S.-China talks and the impact on the pork industry. We'll talk to Dr. Lee Schultz. Uh, He is out of uh, Iowa State, ag economist specializing in the livestock markets, and he focuses in on China relations, on African swine fever, and the potential for futures, so hog futures, uh, because of the situation, also factoring in uh, the Chinese tariff situation. So all that coming your way, plus markets, plus weather, Stay put. We'll be back with more RFD Illinois. With this week's edition of Farm Week, the early word, here's Rita Frazier. When it rains, it pours. New Illinois State Water Survey research shows rainstorms have become much more intense and extensive since the 1980s. Learn more in the latest edition of Farm Week. Illinois Farm Bureau and other members of the Illinois Monarch Project share an agricultural plan to help monarch butterflies. Find out more about those plans and details in your next edition of Farm Week. No other Farm Weekly in Illinois has as many people on the ground in Illinois covering Illinois agriculture for you with the depth on key issues to help keep you profitable. And don't forget, you can get daily or even more frequent updates online anytime at farmweeknow.com. We are back on RFD Illinois on a Monday. That means we get to check in with the corner economist, Mike Doherty. Mike, senior economist at IFB, you have been one busy dude. I, it's been a busy week. It has been. So as we closed out Friday, the breaking news actually came out of the University of Illinois College of Aces, the impact of the 2018 tariffs on Illinois ag. That's right. So this is a long-awaited uh, analysis done by four very respected economists at University of Illinois they released a study showing whether they wanted to answer the question, what was the net negative impact of the tariffs in 2018, just compartmentalizing that to that calendar year, and then these market facilitation program payments that soybean farmers largely went to soybean growers to compensate for the drop in the soybean price as a result of the trade war with China. And they broke it down, as you said, uh, really nice and neat. Corn, soybeans, hogs. Correct. And then they looked at the actual drop in price. They looked at uh, what the farmer, what we could have re- expected for a price had there not been a trade war. That was the tricky part for this analysis was to use regression analysis, uh, which is an econometric technique to mathematically uh, imitate what would have statistically imitate what would have happened if there had not been a uh, a uh, trade war with China, and therefore what prices would have been, and therefore what farmers would have received versus what they did receive from the MFP payments. So what jumped right out at you? Well, first of all, the, the it, using that econometric method, uh, you one could say, and this analysis states this, that the losses uh, to soybeans were completely offset by the MFP payments within that year. This is extremely important caveat to this study is that it, within the calendar year 2018, the level of the MFP, Market Facilitation Program payments, which were meant to compensate the farmers, did indeed compensate them, but only within 2018. Mm-hmm. So, And with a little bit, a very small percentage left over above that, uh, I think the uh, 
it was maybe a, a, a like 1.4 percent uh, above the just break even level of compensating for the drop in the prices, which which means we've got we're faced with 2019 where most of the impact of the ter- of the trade war is actually going to be felt. Mm. And this study did not address that. So, but for corn, it wasn't so rosy. Correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, we had a fa- we had a price effect there. We had a price effect on soybeans. We had had a price effect, you know, on the on the um, on hogs uh, going into 2019. That price effect uh, on corn is getting uh, has gotten worse because we found we had more st- uh, stocks. Uh, in corn than we thought we were going to have going into spring. That's kind of came out of the blue and really hit the markets and sunk the corn prices. Uh, soybeans, we, the the impact, real impact of that trade war for 2018 is the mountain of soybeans that we have in storage now in the United States, unprecedented level of stored soybeans. And our market window for selling those soybeans has kind of passed by. This, we're halfway through the marketing year, which starts – uh, September 1, when the farmers are starting to harvest their crop, that's the beginning of that crop. So the crop that was harvested back in 2018 that is sort of addressed in this study, that crop is still out there. It's all in storage. <laughs> it's sitting there waiting to be sold. Uh, and the trouble is is that um, the competition from South America is now full on. Their crop is harvested and going to port. So Even more of a reason... That agreement between the U.S. and China it needs to be done. Yes, uh, we need to get back to, to at least a, an ability to resurrect our trade relationship we used to have with them. We're, we're losing sales, clearly losing sales that are being picked up by Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, uh, and elsewhere. And uh, we we could be making some of those sales from our beans here, given the inventory we're sitting on. Where can folks find out more about the U of I ACES impact on tariffs study? Well, they can go to uh, farmdoc.com. That you lists every study that the FarmDoc team does. It's a great resource. If you just go to Google FarmDoc, you can look at FarmDoc Weekly, and uh, there's three different categories. There's policy papers on there. There's weekly economic analysis papers, all on focused on Illinois agriculture. Fascinating. And again, we'll have more with The Corner Economist later this week here on RFD Illinois. We'll break and be back with more. Hello, I'm Trooper Teal with the Illinois State Police. April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. According to the most recent report from the National Highway Safety Administration, 394,450 people were either injured or killed in distracted driving-related incidents. Avoid distractions while driving, such as talking on your cell phone, texting, eating, and even adjusting the radio. Wear your seatbelt and remember to just drive. A message from the Illinois Farm Bureau and the Illinois State Police. Attention corn farmers. Your corn checkoff dollars are working with the U.S. Meat Export Federation to grow red meat export volumes. Because when we're exporting beef, we're also exporting corn. The beef industry consumes 28% of all corn fed to livestock, plus additional corn in the form of DDGs, a co-product of ethanol production. Now that's what we call working an angle. Your checkoff is working corn from all angles. Because of the Illinois Corn Marketing Board, your profitability is our bottom line. A message from the Illinois Corn Checkoff. We're back here on RFD Illinois. U.S.-Japan trade talks on agriculture and autos were gaining steam as the two nations' leaders held their talks in Washington last week. RFD Washington correspondent Matt Kay reports. The two sides are looking for a speedy deal on agriculture and autos amid a second round of talks and a White House meeting between President Trump and Japan's Shinzo Abe. American Farm Bureau Trade Chief Dave Salmonson says key for the U.S. side is avoiding changes in U.S law. If it was just a deal that didn't change any U.S. laws or tariffs or anything, you wouldn't need congressional approval on the first part of it that dealt with ag and autos. If in the context of those talks, they added other things that did, then you're into the regular longer procedure. And Salmonson says for agriculture, that could work. And says they'll go as far as they did in the TPP, broadly acceptable, I think, to a lot of ag. Some people want more than they got in TPP, but that'll have to be discussed. 
and then the autos thing. Japan wants to avoid higher U.S. auto tariffs President Trump's threatened and seeks removal of Trump's metal tariffs. U.S. agriculture wants a deal that matches its post-TPP competitors in Japan. What we had was a movement of beef tariff from about 38.5% down to 9% over a period of years. Pork, again, those tariffs were sharply reduced. So a lot of this was tariff. So the real problem for U.S. ag now is our competitors are getting the deal that we had, and we're playing catch-up. So if we make a deal with Japan, we want them to accelerate the tariffs so we're no further behind the Canadians, Mexicans, or Australians. Almost 90 farm groups wrote U.S. Trade Ambassador Robert Lighthizer that U.S. farm goods are losing ground after Japan cut tariffs twice on some Asia-Pacific nations and the EU. For the RFD Radio Network, Matt Kay. Washington. Thanks, Matt. Well, we put our focus on the pork industry, prices, the relationship with China, and the situation with African swine fever. Dr. Lee Schultz is an Iowa State ag economist, and do we have a handle on the numbers of pigs affected in China by African swine fever? The, the answer is is really yes and no. You know, obviously we, we get reports as far as you know where, where they they're seeing new incidents and new outbreaks and continue continuing outbreak. Several analysts have, have put out numbers suggesting anywhere from 100 million, you know, pigs have been, you know, either called or, or affected from this, and that number continues to rise. What we're really watching is, you know, the, the amount of you know, imports that China is bringing in of pork, and that's really kind of serving as a barometer of how large and widespread this impact is of African swine fever. And we look at prices, you know, we've seen prices over in the cash side for for hogs where we haven't seen in many years here in Illinois up to 60 bucks for Illinois direct hogs just yesterday what how do you see those prices being reflected in, in what's to come and a, as we filter through this issue with China when you really look at, at futures prices and cash prices th- there's actually a, a pretty big disconnect and, and we talk about that as basis and futures have really outpaced the cash market so yes cash has been strong but futures have been even stronger. And when we look at futures prices for summer contracts, um, so June, July, um, those contracts in August, those are suggesting really tremendous prices here of, you know, we've been right in that, that dollar range bouncing above and below that. Cash prices have been quite a bit weaker. Now we know seasonally those prices increase, but if those futures prices prove to be true, that that's going to be a tremendous increase in cash market prices and revenue for producers. And I think what those futures markets are suggesting is that demand is going to be very strong both domestically here in the U.S., but really on the world market. And a lot of attention is pointed to the pork deficit in China and how much they're going to need to import here in 2019 and likely into 2020 and even potentially further. What kind of handle do you have on those potential numbers that they will be importing? The best numbers we have right now is the, the weekly trade data that's reported out of the USDA Foreign Agriculture Service. The reason why the weekly data, the data that we're watching is because the official data is only available through February. And we've really seen the impact of exports and prices really started in March and and into April. And the weekly data, we have data through April 18th, so this last week here. And that data is showing China is up 710% compared to a year ago levels. And so that consists of both exports that have been moved to the country, that's up 215%, but also exports that are on the book. So the sales have been made. Now they could cancel those sales, but this year we haven't seen those cancellations. Those are up over 3,000% year to date. And so that shows that there's tremendous buying um, taking place in China, uh, and that's directly related to the African swine fever impact. Um, I think there is a little bit of a, a, a governor in that, though, that we are still facing the 62% tariffs on pork going into China. And so that's going to limit some of the sales or, or the potential that, that could have been there. Mm-hmm. And, and with that said, it's so so ironic, really, because you know we, we've been very optimistic that we're going to see this U.S.-China trade deal very soon, in fact, here within the next few weeks, at the same time dealing with African swine fever. So how do you, you know, advise producers or the industry into what is going to happen if we actually do reach that deal with China? 
Well, I, th- I think it's going to be important of, of what the details of that deal particular are. And, and let's just talk about pork, for example, here. And, you know, realizing that we're facing that 62% tariff, does that tariff get rolled all the way back to the 12% that was the original tariff, or maybe the first round that it, it increased it, it to 37%. So I think all of that's potentially on the table. Also, there's been some discussion about some of the non-tariff barriers, like Ractopamine. The China does not accept pork that has been fed ractopamine or, or paline. Potentially, would we re- receive removal of that ban? Um, I think that's less likely. But you know, that's also I think when when you have these trade talks, really anything is potentially on the table. And so we're, we're seeing you know strong exports. We're seeing reflective, very strong prices. And right now, that that's setting up quite a bit of a large profitability for pork producer. Dr. Lee Schultz, Iowa State. Let's break for markets and weather. With the RFDX market summary for this Monday morning, I'm Jim Taylor. Corn higher, beans lower, and wheat ending Friday slightly higher. May corn closing at 351 and a quarter up three and three quarters. July corn up four, 361 and a quarter. September corn 369 and a half up four. May beans ending Friday 853 and three quarters down five and a half. July beans down five and three quarters, 867. August beans 873 and a quarter down five and a half. May wheat closing 435 up one quarter. July wheat up a penny, 442 and a half. And September wheat ending Friday 450 and a quarter up a penny. May bean meal 299.90 down 610. May bean oil 2752 down 12 cents. And current electronic overnight trading. May corn up two pennies. July corn up one and three quarters. September corn up one and three quarters, 371 and a quarter. May beans in the overnight up one quarter. July beans up one half. August beans up three quarters, 874. May wheat in the overnight down a penny. July wheat down one and a quarter. September wheat down one and a half, 448 and three quarters. In the outside markets, June Brent crude oil, 72.15. That's down 220 a barrel. The June gold contract, 1284.30, down 450. This morning, in the livestock market from Friday, May lean hogs eighty-seven dollars even, down eighty-five cents. June lean hogs eighty-eight seventy-five, down one hundred two. April live cattle one twenty-four fifty-five, that's up half a dollar. June live cattle down thirty-two cents one fifteen oh five. May feeders one forty-three ninety-five, up forty cents. August feeder cattle one fifty-two eighty-five, down forty cents. Cash livestock at Walnut Livestock Auction last week steers. 129, the top of the Illinois direct barrels and gilts trading steady on Friday at 51 to 60. I'm Jim Taylor for the RFD Radio Network. Good morning, this is Dan Hicks from Free Zotus Weather with the early morning ag weather update on the RFD Radio Network for this Monday morning. Two weather systems affected Illinois during the past 48 hours or so. The first moved across the state Saturday and Saturday night, bringing some late-season snowfall to the far northern part of Illinois and some significant rainfall just to the south, extending down into parts of the central part of the state. Precipitation amounts from this first system were lighter in the southern half of the region. The second system moved in fairly quickly from the west during the past 12 to 18 hours, with rain spreading again across the northern and central part of the state. Saturday's weather system resulted in a wide range of temperatures across the state, from well below normal in the north to above normal in the south. Most areas had cooler weather on Sunday. The current system moving through the Midwest will bring some additional rain and thunderstorms to central and northern Illinois today into this evening, with at least some additional quarter to one inch rainfall amounts into early tonight. In the southern part of the state, additional showers will be somewhat lighter and more scattered today into this evening, with greater coverage of rain again affecting the northern and central part of the region. The overall weather pattern looks quite active across the Midwest this week, with additional rain chances moving in from the west off and on through Thursday and Friday. This weather pattern across much of the Midwest this week will keep field work and planting stopped in many locations, at least for the next four or five days. Longer term, it does look like we could see a brief break in the active weather coming up this next weekend, but it still looks like additional rain chances will affect the Midwest during the 6 to 10 day time frame, with 6 to 10 day precipitation amounts averaging near to above normal across most of the Midwest. We will continue to see a Large temperature contrast from northwest to southeast across the region with 6 to 10 day temperatures below normal to the northwest of Illinois and above normal to the southeast. 
I'm Dan Hicks from Freeze Notice Weather. Are you preparing for planting season? We don't mean to be a pest, but here's a few things you need to know before you grow. The Illinois Department of Agriculture now requires special local needs labels, including new restrictions for the use of herbicide dicamba on top of soybeans in Illinois for the 2019 growing season. Did you know these additional restrictions go beyond federally approved labels? Remember, the label is the law. To find out more about these Illinois-specific labels, visit ilfb.org slash label aware. It's where your home is built, your landscape is planted, and your children play. Land is all around us, so Illinois farmers have dedicated years to learning how to best care for it. Today, we're bridging modern knowledge with resources from Mother Nature to promote natural soil activity and choosing crops that enhance soil health. To learn more about conservation efforts, visit ilfarmersconserve.com. Preserving our water, protecting our land, providing our food. This message brought to you by Illinois Farm Bureau. All ag. All Illinois. All now. There are a lot of smartphone apps out there, but do they have what's important to us here in Illinois? The Farm Week Now app does, and it's always at your fingertips. All ag, all Illinois, and 24-7 where and when you need it for free. Go to your app or Play Store on your smartphone, hit search, type in Farm Week Now, that's one word, and download it today. Brought to you by Illinois Farm Bureau, where we're all about farm, family, and food. RFD Radio Network's Rita Frazier connects rural routes for you. Rita delivers passion and reliable information to listeners on the RFD Radio Network. Her radio career spans close to three decades. Here's a bit about her rural roots. I grew up on a small farm. My job today allows me to connect with people from all walks of life and experience opportunity every day. I get to talk about what I love, farming. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. Hey, that's all the time we have for this edition of RFD Illinois. Thanks for spending some time with us today. There is a big event coming up on Saturday, May 4th, in Litchfield at the Ariston Cafe. They are going to relight the signage on the Ariston. This is the oldest continuously operating restaurant on Route 66. We'll salute Litchfield today. Population 7,012. The salute brought to you by Country Financial. Your farm is your family's legacy and a part of your hometown heritage. While you work sun up to sun down, protecting the things that you love, they're here protecting you every step of the way. Country Financial. Visit them at countrycrop.com. I'm Rita Frazier. Have a great day.